Hey everybody, I am Dave Sandell. And I'm Caleb Gardner. And this is the Best Album 4 Podcast, a podcast for getting into Dave and Caleb's favorite band, because it's our birthday week. Yeah. Caleb had the good sense to be born the same week as me, several years later. And yeah. so we get to, once a year, throw all of the rules of Best Album 4 out and just celebrate something that we love. And hopefully it's something that we can introduce you to today, if you haven't already been evangelized by both of us. This is definitely the band that I've been the most evangelistic about in my life. Yeah. Well, well, do you feel like this is the band that we both love that is probably the least known of the bands that we have been vocal about loving? I suppose that's true. It's clearly, it's not Radiohead. Like Radiohead, which right. is actually my favorite band. But Radiohead yeah. is not a band that we need to introduce the world to yeah. at this moment. Exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Of all the bands we love, this is the one that no one's heard of. Because I've introduced several people to this band as well. And if you haven't heard of them, we don't have any judgment about that. <laughs> as opposed to something something else, like your radio head. It's like, what have you been yeah. doing with your life? To be yeah. clear, Dave speaks for himself. I have tons of judgment, actually. What have you been doing this whole time? That's my question. I do you I, one, I want to acknowledge that you were the one who got me into this band. Oh, is that right? That's not oh, yeah. shocking to me, but I didn't I didn't know that. I remember the exact place we were in when you got me into this band. Tell me more. We were sitting on my back porch in our apartment in Andersonville. This was literally 15 years ago. No, <laughs> probably 13 years ago. Because I remember it was right after my son was born. And as we have done for many, many years, we were sitting there talking about music that we loved. Mm -hmm. And I remember you hearing that about some of the music I loved and you were like, there's an album I have you have to listen to. And you gave me this exact album, which got me into this band. And I loved it maybe from the first moment I heard it, like the first song. Yeah. We're going to talk about what a banger the first song on this album is, but like. <laughs> It's so easy to get into this this album. There's so many entry points, but like top to bottom, it's great. If you've been following along in this podcast for the last several months, you're not going to be surprised when we name the band because they just get name dropped every couple episodes. Because <laughs> yeah. it has been such it's a one of those that we name us. drop, but you're like, what was that? Because yeah. <laughs> you probably <laughs> haven't heard them. <laughs> and it's also it's one of those bands that I don't want to like. Waste is the wrong word here, but I want to like have a very special episode about just this band because I don't want to pick a scenario that they go with. I want because yeah. they go with every scenario and also I'll never be able to pick just the best scenario that they, they go with. And so it feels fun that we get to have this little birthday celebration and just talk yeah. for an hour about something that we love. All right, man, let's get into this. Do you want to introduce this week's band? I would love to. I would love to. The the. Band that Dave got me into on my back porch more than 10 years ago that has become a beloved band for both of us is the Scottish band Frightened Rabbit. We come back to my corner, spent too long alone tonight. Would you come and write in my corner? A lips or Album we are gonna talk about today is my favorite album of theirs, and we can talk about whether it is the best album of theirs, The Midnight Organ Fight. It's just a great name. It's such a good name for an album. It comes from the lyrics of one of the songs, Fast Blood. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty understandable euphemism. Yeah. <laughs> it shows how like playful and fun this album is, despite being this very sad, emotional breakup album. Yeah, you know? every every song on here, almost every song in here is about a breakup or about Scott's longing for for love or the lack of love in his life. Yeah, or connecting with people and then feeling like it's shallow or mm -hmm. like there's lots of those themes. But it's pure joy. The whole thing all the way through is just pure joy. Uh, even at the end, which is going to be very hard to talk about <laughs> uh, yeah. this week. Well, I'm going to save that for a little bit, but it's just catharsis uh, for the entire stretch of this really heavy breakup album. Yeah, but like funny, it's not only fun, it's funny at times. There's some lyrics in here. I, I think of Good Arms versus Bad Arms as one of the funniest songs on the set. Like it's it's fun. Again, it's tragic in some cases, but like it's got these lyrics about how basically someone that he loves is falling in love with someone else. That's mm -hmm. kind of Good Arms versus Bad Arms. But then there's these lyrics like I'm armed to the teeth and I'm heavy set." <laughs> 
<laughs> like, like try to be threatening, but clearly not threatening at all. Don't brush with him. He might have diseases. <laughs> it's so like self-deprecating in this really playful, fun, but also so tragic and relatable way. There's this song called The Twist, which isn't one of my favorite songs on the record, but some of these lyrics really make me laugh. So early in the song, he sings this chorus that goes, you twist and whisper the wrong name. I don't care, nor do my ears. But not whispering his name, but some other guy's name. Twist yourself around me. I need company. I need human heat. So that's all very plaintive and longing. And then later in the song, he says, twist and whisper the right name. I'm Dave, if you please. <laughs> the twist is that you're just like me. You need company. You need human heat. So I love that he like names the person at the end. And it's yeah. not lost to me that it's my name. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> so when I sing along to that lyric, it's very odd. <laughs> I also don't know what to think about the fact that it's not actually his name. Yeah, like, right. What? It's not actually his name. <laughs> is he basically saying like, tell the truth, but also I'm not even going to give you the truth. Like you're still lying. I've always taken it to mean more like, uh, he's just going to be that person tonight. Like he'll just be day yeah, right. for the evening for you. And he'll just pretend he is just so that he can have somebody close to him for an evening. We are getting way ahead of ourselves here. Let's go back to full stop. Why we love frightened <laughs> rabbit. So this is like Caleb said, this is a band from Scotland and the kind of kind of Scottishness of it all is dripping on this record. There's this sort of, propulsive the tempos and the the rhythms of this record are very fun and waltzy and and maybe a little bit americana that came out of that stretch of indie rock back in the early 2000s where everybody was kind of dipping a toe in americana but uh, this is a, essentially a four-piece band uh, Scott has said in interviews that when he made this record, he didn't want to mess around with pedals or effects. He just wanted to find out what he could do with strings and frets and, and see the different ways that he could make his guitar sound and, and find different ways to develop this big, lush, beautiful sound out of just their basic instruments. And, and I think that they did that in spades because this record is gorgeous throughout. I love the production. I love the tone of the guitars. It just all sounds very like live and in your bedroom, like they're playing right there in the room with you. And there's something about Scott. He's so personable. He's so like lively and animated and charismatic and probably the accent helps. Um, uh, that yeah. It just feels very like he feels like my buddy. And that came to be true yeah. after I saw them many, many times. Like that actually started to feel true. But even just on first listen, he felt like somebody who I knew, like somebody who wasn't yeah. just this rock star, but was somebody who you might meet in a bar someday. I mean, very relatable. And I'm surprised that you didn't start with his accent because I feel like the thing that makes it feel the most <laughs> Scottish is first time I listened to this, the first thing I wanted to know is, oh, where's this guy from? Like his his accent drips out of his out of his vocals in a way that is very unique. I mean, we talked a lot about vocalists and their ability to make a band really stand out and be unique. And I think that's also true of Frightened Rabbit because of Scott Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously he brings all kinds of his creativity and lyricism and musicianship to Frighten Rabbit wouldn't be the same without him. But that voice, man, it gets you. It, <laughs> it because really it just does. sounds like there's something about the, the Scottishness that, that sounds emotive right from the start. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the, the voice drips with emotion, even drips with that kind of self-deprecating humor, even when he's saying something tragic. What's interesting is that I, so since there's not going to be any more Frightened Rabbit music, I've spent a lot of time trying to scratch that itch and I've listened to a lot of Scottish bands and none of them hit me quite the same way as Scott did. And I think a lot of that mm. is because of his lyricism. I think that he yeah. writes these, these irreverent, playful lyrics about really relatable human things. And, and I will say I've never had a really intense breakup. I've actually only had a breakup with one person and it was in high school. So I, I don't necessarily know that I can like relate to every, every lyric that comes out here, but I have found myself being very helped and, and seen in this album because I feel like even though he's specifically talking about a breakup, he's getting into deeper things about what it means to be human and what it means to have longing, what it means to have desire, what it means to have uh, unrequited love or, or wanting mm -hmm. something that you can't have or or getting something and it's not what you wanted it to be. These are very universal themes, even if you don't have a string of breakups in your, sure. in your history. 
that you can relate to. But we are going to gonna circle back on our best breakup album to the fact that you've only had one breakup because we need to hear more of that story. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that exciting. It's high school, man. That's just that smart. is that is fascinating. <laughs> but that's for the that's for the best breakup album episode. Fair I also enough. want to reflect on the fact that when we were talking about the Scottishness of this album, you described it as Americana. Sure. I get that. I get that. But that's what everybody sounded like back in the early 2000s. Yeah, totally. Totally. It was a special moment in time, I think, mm-hmm. that this album really, really did a lot for. But yeah, it's so good. When I was first getting into these guys, I was a pastor. And and a lot of their lyrics are are deeply irreverent of religion. <laughs> and uh, yeah, ex- wrestling explicitly. with what it means that I fell in love with this band while also being a pastor actually kind of like threw me a little bit. They might've even jumpstarted us in deconstruction for me in some ways. You know, I think ah, that what I believed and what I was willing to be constrained by, what it meant to me that I was really taken with this record, even though it didn't necessarily fit neatly into an album that I could say to every other person in the church, <laughs> you should go listen yeah. to this record. It was helpful, but I think that there was just such joy in the music. And I think Finding joy and beauty out of something that is deeply sad and, and maybe even tragic is like the sweet spot to my heart, you know, and so mm-hmm. these guys do that better than anyone. Yeah, they really do. And we should call out that head rolls off as the quintessential version of that on this record. And I remember yeah. the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, OK, like it comes out. <laughs> the first line of it is Jesus is just a Spanish boy's name. <laughs> <laughs> Why did one man get so much fame? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then, but it's, it's, it's what's so striking about that song is that it's hopeful. I'm going to make tiny changes to earth. Like it's, you come across listening to that song and you're like, it's so anti-religion and anti-establishment. And then like, wait, it's also an anthem. What? Right. An anthem about how we're actually going to change the world, even though we yeah. have bought into religion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Wild. These guys came together in Selkirk, Scotland in 2003. It was largely just Scott. Scott has been the primary singer-songwriter for the run of this band. He brought on his brother, whose name is Grant Hutchison. So Scott Hutchison is the lead singer, Grant Hutchison, his brother on drums. And then they added Billy Kennedy on guitar. And then they brought on Andy Monaghan, whose name I might be mispronouncing because I'm not Scottish, on guitars and keyboards. Mm-hmm. And there have been other people who've weaved in and out of the band. But they formed in 2003. They had an album in 2006 called Sings the Grays that is largely an independent production that they put out there so they could try to get signed and have more money to make a proper album. Scott has said that he actually had written many of the songs for Midnight Organ Fight while they were writing the songs for Sings the Grays, and they held them back because they knew they were really good, and they didn't want to put them on this record that sounded kind of poor. You know, like it's yeah. when you listen to Sings the Grays, there's some cool stuff on it, but it sounds like you made it on a tape player in your bedroom. <laughs> like it's not... Yeah. Uh, it's not high production value. It's basically a, a album of demos, right? That's right. Basically an album of demos, but it's great. It's definitely worth diving into, although I would put it as maybe the last thing you listen to. If you're just getting into Frightened Rabbit, I wouldn't start with Sings the Grays. 100%. Uh, and if they get signed to a, a record label, they uh, they put out Midnight Organ Fight in 2008. I discovered Midnight Organ Fight while watching an episode of the TV show Chuck. <laughs> really? Uh, yep. So in, in 2008... Chuck was one of my very favorite shows at the time. And they, the guy who uh, wrote that show, Josh Schwartz, was part of like the OC and, and other, other shows that broke new artists pretty regularly. And they knew how to use artists in ways that brought out the fullness of, their, of what, they, what they were bringing to the table. And the, I think it was The Twist came on. And I thought, this is cool. I like this. And then later, Keep Yourself Warm was part of the, the, the album later on that year. And so I started listening to... The Minette Organ Fight based on the twist because that was a cool song. And I remember like not totally liking it at first. I I thought this is good, but there's something missing. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I liked it enough that I kept listening to it. And I found that like three or four months later, I was still listening to it a lot. And I thought, well, do I like this up more than I think I do? And I don't know what the what the like <laughs> thing in my brain <laughs> was that was thing. holding me back from like fully embracing this album. But I just thought like, well, I just, it's just not my favorite album. I was really into this band called Margo and the Nuclear So-and-Sos. I was really into Spoon. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember uh, going with to a con- Margo concert with you. Yeah, I invited all my friends. I paid for tickets for all my friends to that Margo show. And I was really enjoying Frightened Rabbit, but it just didn't feel like it was, it was elevating something in my soul yet. And I don't know if it was seeing them live for the first time or if it was just living with that record for a year. But I found that after a while, it's all I was listening to. 
and I was memorizing all the lyrics, which is very rare for me. I didn't usually, I don't usually spend time memorizing lyrics to albums. And I was starting to actually pick up on the lyrics, which is even a big thing because sometimes I miss lyrics altogether until later. And there was something about the cathartic, joyful nature. I keep saying that word, but this cathartic, joyful nature of this music that started to feel really important because at this time I was starting to go through therapy. I was uncovering some deep, dark stuff about myself. And so that like melancholy, but hopeful sound that they hit at had a real clear space in my life. And then as I kept going, I realized, oh my gosh, this might be my favorite band ever. <laughs> like the Midnight Organ Band quickly became the album that I only wanted to listen to. And, and it, was, it was deeply evangelistic about and told all my friends, you've got to get into this band. They're amazing. Which was probably the era that I came in when you were telling me probably, about it. Probably, yeah. So I, I saw them several times, at least a half dozen times, maybe more. And you know, kind of listened to them constantly throughout those years. And I started to feel very close to Scott. Scott has no idea who I am. He's never met me. I've never met him. Uh, but <laughs> I started feeling very close to him because at his shows, he is very personable. Like he talks a lot 100%. from the stage. He, he, in interviews and on Twitter, he's just very himself all the time. And you feel like you're getting the actual raw, authentic Scott. And that was such a breath of fresh air based on all these other rock bands where I, there's always this distance. Yeah. Like even the rock bands who really care about their fans, there's always this distance. And I felt like for Scott, there just was no distance. I remember <laughs> my favorite memory of, of Scott at a concert was at Lincoln Hall. They came out and we were really, really close to the front of the stage. They came out and uh, he was in a bad mood. Like he was just really prickly. And, and a little gruff and just not happy to be there. And it was weird because that's not the Scott that I'm used to seeing. And he starts telling this story as the show goes on, like over the course of four or five songs about how they had just done this tour in Canada. They had all this cash and they got to the border of America and the American border agents took all of their money and they had no real sense of how they could possibly get it back. And so they had just spent weeks touring in Canada and they had nothing to show for it. They had no money. They were like now touring in America and, and just feeling really bitter and angry about that whole experience, which is totally understandable. I guess they had crossed the border either that morning or, or, or later, late their previous evening. And he was so mad. And suddenly about five songs in, he goes, what am I doing? You guys didn't pay to come see us so that I could wind you for two hours. He said, why don't we just start over? And they like, they, he took a shot of whiskey and just all oh of a sudden God. his whole demeanor changed and he just felt like we were all hanging out in his living room. And he would like talk about, I can't believe that I just spent five songs whining to you about our problems. <laughs> and all of us were like, no, it's great. Keep whining. And the whole night there was a, he came out for the encore, um, and he did like, maybe as a way of making up to us, maybe because this is what he did every concert, but he did like four or five songs, just him on his guitar. And he was just taking requests from the, from the room. And oh, the room awesome. was small enough that, you know, the people requesting it were us and like people around us. Yeah. And so he was like engaging with the fans, like actually having prolonged conversations about what he could sing and couldn't sing tonight because of his voice or, or songs that he remembered or didn't remember. <laughs> and <That's funny. laughs> it was just really, he was just really fun and he was really personable. And I got to feel like very close to this artist, I guess this musician. And that's a very different experience than I usually have with musicians. Yeah. I usually don't feel that close personal connection. You're saying you don't, you, you and Tom York aren't on the same wavelength. So you're trying to say Tom York doesn't seem like, He's on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> I spent so many hours listening to uh, Tom York interviews and it's never had the same. Although there was an episode of uh, what's the podcast with uh, Will Arnett and Jason Bateman, and Sean Hayes. Oh, I know which one you're talking about. I don't remember yeah. the name. Well, if you guys can figure it out, you can look up this episode. But there is an episode where Johnny and, and Tom are on it. And uh, they basically talk about how they like to have fun. They like being fun people, but whenever they get into interviews, everybody asks them all these serious questions. <laughs> and so they, they worry that they just always come off as really boring <laughs> as you go. Interesting. That's funny. Yeah. I have so many questions about that story. One being, does Canada only pay its musicians in cash? Like, are they just, I'm imagining them just like driving around in a van with stacks of cash. And I'm like, why? That does not seem like a economically viable situation like yeah, i don't i don't know like, what the what? circumstance was that he they hadn't like uh, you know <laughs> just got like got bags of bank. cash <laughs> uh, yeah i don't i don't understand that but i do think that based on the few fight and rabbit concerts i went to as well 
like I just you got the the sense that there was no other Scott that he could be. You know, there was mm-hmm. no like the raw and authentic was him. Like he just he couldn't be any other way. And I think that comes across in his music and his and his voice and his lyricism. But I agree that like in person, he was just so so relatable. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you want to talk about Midnight Organ Fight for a little bit? Hey, let's do that. Let's do it. So there's a few quotes I want to I want to read you from Scott because they felt they felt very perfect. I said, following the album's completion, it took about a month for him to be able to listen to it. And he said, it's very important to move the listener. And I feel that it's music's main goal to make another human feel something. He says, I can still mm. visualize the event in each song, which perhaps makes the delivery more genuine. And he that. said, 80% of the conversations that he he's had, or I'll, I'll read it from his, his voice. 80% of the conversations I have with members of our audience are about that record, where they were in their life when they heard it, what happened to them, how it helped them, how for some of them mm. it saved their life or saved a friend or family member's life. And I don't say that flippantly. I mean it for real. I think it's quite a hopeful record in a lot of ways. I was working my way out of some mistakes that I'd made in a relationship. I didn't write the majority of those songs in the moments. A lot of the feelings had been given some time to stew and distill. And I was able to look forward rather than just being in the mire. Thinking about songs like Floating in the Fourth, I didn't kill myself. I took that forward onto other records. There's got to be a sense that as fucked up as life can get, we're still alive. We're still doing this. We're going to attempt to carry on. I do think it's wrongly perceived as a very sad record. Although Mm, there are some miserable moments on it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, 100%. I was reading, like going back and reading my reviews when this came out. And I think the one that really captured it for me was from Josh Model or Model, however you say that, from the AV Club. It's Hutchinson's utterly believable desperation and frank lyrics Mm -hmm. that pushed the whole thing from good to great. It doesn't make for easy listening, but nothing this flatly honest and powerful ever is. I would take issue with it doesn't make for easy listening. I think this, I find this album very easy to listen to. I think that's right. I, but do you feel like, so I was going back and thinking about this album in the context of their entire catalog. Mm-hmm. There was definitely a lot of people who were like, oh my, oh man, their sophomore effort. They got it right. They perfected their sound. This is like so good. Yeah. But then I felt like every album that came after this was different than this one. Hmm. Like they pushed for more kind of stadium kind of sound, like a fuller. Yeah, like anthemic. Y- yeah. Like don't you? Because I, I mean, and not always in a bad way necessarily, of course, but like there's something that feels very raw and stripped down about this album that didn't, I didn't feel like that about albums that came after this. Scott has said that he felt like their their next album was overproduced and that his favorite album was their fourth album, Pedestrian Verse. Because... Which I've heard as like people will rank as their best album. I certainly, I think for me, I find Pedestrian Verse to be their best like most accomplished album, I should say. Mm-hmm. Like I find that the musicianship and lyricism and production quality all came together the best on that record. And there's some killer songs there, but I certainly go back yeah. to Midnight Organ Fight more. I, I would not call Pedestrian Verse my favorite Frightened Rabbit album, even though I think it is maybe the best Frightened Rabbit album, but also not the one I would tell people to start with. So I don't even know what that means. I know, right? Like I don't... Well, I've, I've had a really hard time trying to unpack. Do I just love this album the most out of their entire catalog because it was my entry point and I've listened to it the longest and I have the you know most affinity and nostalgia for it? Or is it genuinely the best album? Because I don't think the albums have as many entry points as this album does. Mm-hmm. I guess I, I agree with you, although I might say that we have projected a lot of our life experiences onto this record. And yeah, I was maybe. talking to one of my one of my friends, one of my favorite people the other day, and she said something like, just because an album is like the best album doesn't mean it's the most sacred to you. And that feels right to me. Like this, hmm. this record feels sacred to me because I'd had so much of my life mapped on top of it. And we've talked about that in past episodes too, like yeah. the place that music sits with us. I guess what I might say though, is that I would s- assume this record is the easiest to map your life onto. <laughs> and so if somebody's listening to this right? album for the first time based on this episode, which obliged everyone, thank you for doing that. Let's keep this alive. Let's keep these guys alive. Uh, I think that people will find that it's easier to, to f- this album will become sacred quicker than any of the other records will. And there are songs Mm. that I certainly have holding that esteem 
from the rest of their catalog. Uh, the right. loneliness and the scream might be my favorite Fighting Rabbit song. And that's off of Winter of Mixed Drinks. But Midnight Organ Fight for me is the sacred record. It's the only one for me. And again, I don't, I don't, I, I this is the sacred versus the best, I think is definitely uh, is at play here. But it's, this is the only one to me where it's like every single song, like front to back, this album I would put on and be singing along with every single song. Yeah. Feel something different with every single song. And it's not that the other albums necessarily have filler, but yeah, they don't, they don't they have do. the same emotional resonance where it's like one song will have a ton of emotional resonance. The other one, I'll be like, oh, yeah, this song. Do you know what I mean? It's just not <laughs> sure. that must be a personal, like sacred thing about it. But I don't know. Like, I think what I struggle, the the reason why I have a hard time not thinking of it as their best album is because I don't know that I would know of an entry point. Like usually if an album is really sacred to me, but they have a whole catalog and other ones that critically have gotten more acclaim. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that I would recommend the one that's sacred to me as an entry point for other people. But this one, I feel like you can enter at so many points in this album and relate to it and map your life to it, to your point. I don't know that you can do that with a lot of the other albums. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think I agree with that for sure. Let's go front to back a little bit. Let's talk about some of these songs. Uh, I'm curious which ones matter the most to you, uh, you know, over over the last 10 plus years. So The Modern Leper opens this album and is for me personally. Ah. So The Cure has plain song, right? The Cure has plain song at the beginning of Disintegration. <laughs> I love that so you're already I can't correcting yourself. Say, I can't say this is the best opening track of any album that I love. It can't be Kid A because of everything in this right place and it's perfect. However, I must say, <laughs> when the Modern Leper comes on, I have no choice but to listen to the rest of the album. There's something about the Modern <laughs> Leper that that pulls me in, and I can't if it's on shuffle. I'm like, well, forget the rest of this shuffled playlist. I got to go listen to <laughs> Midnight Organ Pie right now. And so, for that reason, I'm going to call this my favorite album opener ever. A cripple walks amongst you all, you tired human beings. And I think that there's something about the the propulsiveness of of the guitars and, and the drums and, and these ridiculously fun lyrics of a person whose body is literally falling to pieces, and he's wondering why would you possibly love somebody who's falling to pieces like me? The Modern Leper is, I think, it's it. It is the best opening track. <laughs> it's a banger. I just, I also, by the way, I don't think I put any of these songs on any playlist because the minute any of these songs come on, I'm like, Oh God, now I have to go listen to this album. Yeah. But a modern leper is like, it pulled me into this album from the start when you were like, go listen to this album like that from like, from the opening little like staccato, like guitar <laughs> riff, yeah. riff. You're like, Oh, okay. Like I'm into this. <laughs> yep. It starts then- with that, that little riff. And then Scott's voice, and then a little bling. It's just uh-huh. perfect. <laughs> and then it's got, and then it builds to this. It, you're right. The oh, lyricism man. around this, like, like how could you love something so broken? And it builds to this insanely fun, emotional, like climax of like him just belting it out. Oh man, it's so good. <laughs> So in that big cathartic ending, it says, and you're not ill and I'm not dead. Doesn't that make us the perfect pair? Just sit with me and we'll start again. And you can tell me about all what you tell me all about what you did today. I think it's such a like fun this whole time. He's like, you're a masochist for loving me. You're you're a crazy person for loving me. Even though I don't have eyesight anymore, the limbs, my limbs have literally fallen off my body. But by the end, he's like, well, I guess I guess we're we're here together and it's good. (laughs) It's good that you like me and I like you. <laughs> oh, God. This acceptance piece. It's so fun. And it's such a it's, yeah, like wonderful anthemic build. Seeing the song live is so chill inducing. It's so cool. It's a perfect encapsulation from the first experience of this band about Scott's voice. Yeah, like, absolutely. You hear the, you, again, I, the first thing I ever heard, I was like, oh, I got to know this guy's story. I got to know where he's from. Like you hear the accent, but then you hear this like, 
his ability to do both the kind of quiet, but also mm -hmm. these like loud belty parts. Like it's yeah. just such a, such a great injury point into him as a, as a singer and a musician. And he's so good at those belty parts just coming deep from his diaphragm. Like he is wailing yes. out there. And and does not disappoint when he does that live. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's this thing they have to know about Scott, which is that he was dripping in sweat by the end of the first song on his <laughs> on his concerts. He just puts all he has into every everything he ever did. Even the stuff that I find middling or not that interesting, like the Owl John album or, or you know, some other things that he made that they're fine. Like there's a few there's a few things they made that are fine. He yeah. still puts all of himself into into those records and into all the art that he creates. And some people have asked him, like, are you crying? And he's like, I'm just covered in sweat. <laughs> but it sounds like he could be crying because he's yelling these, you know, these crazy profound lyrics at the yeah. top of his lungs. And it's just wonderful. It goes next into I Feel Better. You want to talk about I Feel Better? Yeah, it's just the rhythms on I Feel Better is probably mm. the thing that gets me the most. It's got this amazing drum line and it's just, I feel like the, God, we are going to come across as such fanboys in a sound like that's the whole <laughs> it's point. okay. That's the point. <laughs> I feel like the, the transition between Modern Leper when you're like, oh my God, what an, what an opener. Where could they go from here? And yep. then you get to I Feel Better and it's this kind of dancey rhythmic song. And you're like automatically up and out of your seat and dancing along with it. you're like i don't yeah how is a scottish band making me like so move so much it's just it, there's no reasonable explanation when i think about scottish music i think about like bars with with little drums and, and lots of acoustic guitars and, and getting the whole bar dancing a reel and it feels it feels like of course it's scottish of course this music is the scottishness of this music is always on display uh because this music is just so full of life and happiness i love that i feel better doesn't start small like it picks up where the modern leopard leaves off where i mean yes, it doesn't exactly. start with the full cathartic moment but it starts quickly and you within a couple notes you're right into the full band launching and doing their thing which is which that's is so exactly fun. right i think that's why it's such a good transition song from modern leopard because it keeps with the same energy yeah, absolutely. And again, just talking about the lyricism, I just now I'm free in parentheses and not sure what I should do with it. And then my favorite part of it is probably how it ends with this is the last song I'll write about you. And it's the second song on the album. So it's like <laughs> clearly not true. I love it. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's great. Okay, then it moves into Good Arms versus Bad Arms. This is the one we talked about earlier. I decided this decision some six months ago, so I'll stick to my guns, but from now on, it's war. I'm armed with the past and a will and a brick. <laughs> I love this idea. <laughs> so of good. The things he has, the weapons he has at his disposal to take on her new boyfriend is the past and his will and a brick. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so <laughs> visceral and guttural and like moving, but also like ugly. <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> I think this may be one of my best, one of my favorite songs on the album. Oh, really? So, yeah. Talk on it. I think it's because, one, it's really fun to play on guitar. I've come back and like mm. played this. It's got this really fun like rhythm in three, and it's really fun to play. And just the playful lyricism, are, again, around this like tragic breakup and the self deprecation here. It's so rich. I just don't know how to describe it other than that. There's just so much area to explore here where you discover something else mm. and just like, You'll hear it, and then four listens in, you're like, I didn't even realize he said a brick there. That, that's amazing. I'm armed with the past and the will and a brick. We move into Fast Blood, uh, where the title comes from. It's this, the song is just one euthem euphemism after another. <laughs> There's this idea that he has decided to do something that is a bad idea. But it feels really good. And so he's stuck with how can something that is obviously bad for me feel this good? But then once it's over, it's kind of just done. And you're just kind of laying there feeling like, what? I don't know. <laughs> was that, was yeah. that worth it? Yeah. The normal kind of regret that you feel after that kind of thing. Uh, I, again, I actually don't have any experience with that, <laughs> that, experience, <laughs> with that feeling. <laughs> but. Would you? Would you say this is the first song that like has overtones of seriousness? Like as you're like the mm. first three are just so playful. And then Fast Blood is the first one where it feels like, okay, there's a little bit. It's not a down tempo because this is still an up tempo yeah. song, but there's a little bit of a um, overtones of 
I, I guess it is that regret where he's trying to get into like actually there's some mistakes being made here. Fuck, 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 fuck. That is going to come back again and again throughout the rest of the record. So that, that might be a good insight that this is where the record kind of turns away from just being mad <laughs> to being like more introspective yeah. about how is this affecting me. I wouldn't necessarily say that you can follow a story in order by listening to these songs, but maybe you can. Maybe there's something about the the sequencing of these these tracks that's meant to tell a larger story. I yeah, never maybe. heard him say that, but there's there, that is interesting that we, we've started to move into different territory. Uh, but then we go into old, old fashioned, which is very different. <laughs> oh, let's get old fashioned back how things used to be. <laughs> which is a very different tone shift, exactly. Yeah. It's just we go into a dance song. It's very yeah, this strange. This is just an old, old timey waltz, uh, radio yep. in the corner. <laughs> type type waltz and uh it's really lovely this is probably my favorite song that i i when i saw fright and rabbit with my wife several times it was fun to you know kind of cuddle up and dance a little bit to this song this one is hard to not love even if it's not a song that i go back to time and again yeah it's just this is just pure fun and the lyricism here is still there like in terms of telling a story about like how we are numbing ourselves with media and can we just get back to like having fun together but not in a not in a serious or like breakup or heartbreak kind of way yeah right? not in a judgmental way necessarily just a sort of longing for something better something different something new yeah uh, it moves into the twist we talked about the twist anything else you want to say about the twist we talked about the twist earlier so i don't know that there's a lot we need to add but just in that hell surprise surprise we got another euphemism for sex another i should say another euphemism for sex with the wrong person that's interesting yeah it's that's interesting i i i have this sense of uh this song is actually about dancing being on a dance floor with another person but I suppose it has to be about sex too. <laughs> I don't know why that never occurred to me till just now. I assumed that, I guess that's a good question. It could be about dancing with the wrong person. I just assumed that I need human heat. Company, I need human heat. I need human heat. I think he just wants to be close to somebody. I think when you're real lonely, you just want to be near another person. But yeah, maybe you're not wrong. You're not wrong. There's there's plenty here to to lend credence to your theory. Uh, yeah, there's a couple interlude tracks on this record that we don't necessarily need to talk through, other than they're nice and pretty. They they don't really they're not profound songs or anything like that, but they're nice. And uh, we move into heads roll off. This is the while I'm alive, I'll make tiny changes to the earth. <laughs> There is a, a movement. There's a lot of things that have happened in the wake of... So Scott is no longer with us, and we'll talk about that later. But yeah. in the wake of Scott's death, there has been a movement of these people. This person made all these stickers that says, I'll make tiny changes to the earth. And you basically send him money. He sends you the stickers, and then he donates all that money to this mental health organization mm. that they founded in, in Scott's name. And uh, these stickers are just all over the world. And <laughs> they like to post pictures of where people are putting them all over the world and in, in, on, on their Instagram feed. I, I left somewhere in San Francisco when we visited there a couple of years ago. I assume they're no longer oh, there, awesome. but if you run into one in San Francisco, that was me. <laughs> so, and I have a whole bunch of women here that are just waiting for our next big vacation. My backwards walk. I think, I think this is my second favorite song of this album. I really love my backers walk and it wasn't necessarily originally my in, in that kind of rarefied air for me, but every time I listen to it, I find something new to love. This is one of those albums that or, I'm sorry. One of those songs where I kind of just want to read you like 12 lyrics. Yeah, right. <laughs> the whole thing. is great. I've been working on my backwards walk. So I guess you have to decide for our listeners. Am I reading you 12 lyrics? Probably not, right? <laughs> pick your favorite. Pick your favorite. All right. Pick my favorite. Oh, they're so hard to pick my favorite. So each, each, each one kind of follows the same pattern. He's working on something and it's not going very well, but he's trying real hard to move on with his life. So he says, I'm working on my faults and cracks, filling in the blanks and gaps. And when I write them out, they don't make sense. I need you to pencil in the rest. I'm working on drawing a straight line and I'll draw until I get one right. It's bold and dark girl, can't you see? I've done drawn a line between you and me. 
I'm just going to keep going. I'm working on erasing you. Just don't have the proper tools. I get hammered. Forget that you exist, but there's no way I'm forgetting this. I'm working hard. I'm walking out. Shoes keep sticking to the ground. My clothes won't let me close the door. These trousers seem to love your floor. That's just... <laughs> that's, that was my uh, favorite one. I was That's the one I was waiting for you to get to. Is my clothes won't let me close the door. These trousers seem to love your floor. It's just an amazing, amazing little couplet. Uh, so I could go on and on about the song. I guess we're 48 minutes in. We should probably move on. But <laughs> yeah, do you, you love can't, you get yeah. You have to end with you're the shit and I'm knee deep in it. Because that's so... <laughs> just the, the repetition of that at the end of that song is so good. You're the shit and I'm knee deep. It is. It's funny because whenever that comes on, I, I have this sense of like, this is such an obvious lyric and it it feels like it's unworthy of this album, but also it's perfect because it's playful <laughs> and silly and, and big cathartic, you know, ending of this of yep. this song. Yeah, it's a like it, it's a like tone shift too. it's like this slow kind of dredging song, regretful song. And then it like has this fun tone shift at the end of you're the shit and I'm knee deep. And then all of a sudden it's like fast and playful again. Yeah, which is funny because he's basically saying, like, you are the worst and I can't, I just have to keep going back to you. Yep, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, keep Yourself Warm. Do you love Keep Yourself Warm? I do. Yeah. Do, what, do you not? So I got to say, the, <laughs> the, the constant F-bombs in this song are occasionally too much <laughs> like I, oh tell me more do you mean like because if you're playing it with your family you're like oh, damn, well I need certainly to i just song. have to skip the song that's absolutely true i guess it's one of those things where he's done so much euphemism throughout the whole record that now he's just throwing euphemism out <laughs> yeah he's just being super explicit about it it takes more than fucking someone you don't know to keep yourself warm like that's is- just an extraordinary sentiment and, yeah. and i this song is perhaps the song most like that is most loved in their whole catalog. I think his Scottish accent and their Scottishness allows this song to work. I think if an American was singing this song, we would all think, I don't know. Oh, that's an interesting <laughs> theory. <laughs> that's funny. But it's beautiful. The song is beautiful. Yeah, it's a well, it's I think it's the music that gets me about this more than the lyrics. Cause I agree actually of all the songs that on this album, these lyrics are the most simplistic. The the first verse is my hole, I'll get my hole, I'll get my hole, get my hole. It's just like, it's just almost like you didn't know what to say. It's just repeating the same thing. So I would say that some, the, the lyrics here are more simplistic. I don't necessarily love them. Although when he, the first time he sings that, it takes more than fucking someone you don't know. You're like, whoa, okay. He's just yeah. coming out and saying it. <laughs> like, And it's wonderful. I mean, can you see in the dark? Can you see the look in your face? The flashing white light's been turned off. You don't know who's in your bed. This is yeah. a... Yeah, this is this is a great this is a great song. I don't know why I'm pooping on this song. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right that it's like there's no euphemism here. He just comes out and says it. But yeah. I think the it's the build in this song that you just cannot like there's been a few times, I'll be honest with you, where I'm listening to the song and I'm driving, I have to pull over hmm. and just engage with this song and uh, let that's it awesome. build. Do you know what I mean? Because it just this slow, it's got this organ grinding background mm-hmm. and it just builds and builds and builds. And it's just, you can't, how could you not feel something? Are you a monster? You have to feel something. Yeah. So just for people who are not initiated into Scottish slang, a uh, whole is having sex with somebody who you're not in a relationship with. Yeah. I just, I discovered that three years after I started listening to the song. I thought, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I thought it meant something else. That was I don't maybe feel a like dirtier. a whole is subtle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but it could mean something else. Okay, so extra super very, and then finally my favorite fight and rabbit song of all time, which is poke. Poke at my iris. Why can't I cry about this? Maybe there is something that you know that I don't. This song makes me tear up. It's another one of those songs where I can't necessarily relate to the lyrics in the sense of I haven't experienced the thing that Scott is experiencing, but I have experienced deep heartache and I have experienced deep sadness and longing and losing things that you love. And so while I don't necessarily, this is an imagination exercise that that kind of allows this to sit in my heart, (laughs) Polka has become my favorite song. And I think part of that is he plays it solo at his shows. 
And, and there's this really beautiful falsetto that he moves into that is very moving. So I remember sitting under these stars at a beach in Wisconsin on a lounge chair and just listening to poke in my headphones and feeling like this overwhelming sense of this person helps me know what it's like to be me. He helps me feel something that is true inside of me uh, because of his authenticity and his honesty. Uh, it pulls something out of me. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, totally. My question is, did you love this song as much as you do before you Scott, saw Scott do this live? Because him doing this live is a is a complete experience, just yes. this song. I agree with that. It's hard to remember, right? Like this was so many yeah. years ago at this point. I've it's just been one of those songs that has lived with me for so long. I don't remember, but I, mean, I can't not picture Scott doing it. So, I, you know, I, you, you have some opinions about watching live things on YouTube that are a little bit different than mine. I find <laughs> I find watching live concerts on YouTube very edifying and and lovely. I actually sometimes feel like I'm there because I've been to enough concerts ah. now that I know what it would feel like to be there, and I can just paint a little bit of that past sense memory onto this thing oh, that I'm watching and I'm able to take it in, you know, in a way that feels unique and special, but I would recommend anybody who, who loves this, this album or this band to go find one of the, the several recordings of Pope. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately that that's the only way you're going to be able to see this done live now, right. but right. he does this thing, which I've seen him do this multiple times. I'm sure you've seen him even more than me where when he's doing this live and, and just so you know, you go to listen to the song, it's basically an acoustic guitar song, yeah. but he, steps away from the mic at the quietest part of this song and basically like forces a hush over the audience just to hear him do this lovely little melody. This little, little falsetto, not even really saying anything hook that he does. And he he just he causes this like emotional hush over the audience. It's just like unreal. And it's invitational because every show that I saw him at, except for like Lollapalooza, but every show that I saw him at where it was like a room full of people who love Fighting Rabbit. And this is one of those bands that if you like them, you love them. Like they are your yeah. favorite band. Every show that I saw him do that at, within a couple of lines of him stepping back from the mic and doing the falsetto part, the whole audience started to do it with him. And none of us are able to do it. You know, like it's a really high part, but all of us sounded great. <laughs> like we just sounded really good and in harmony with him. Yes. And he would always note it like, you guys sound great. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's just like the the feelings that this song provokes just, just kind of like pour out of you. Like they have no choice but to overflow into this cathartic thing of the whole room singing the falsetto part in poke. I have I have um, one specific memory, which you're going to love, of the first time I saw Frightened Rabbit, I believe was with you, which isn't a surprise, <laughs> um, in one of those smaller venues. And when he started doing that thing that he does, which is walking away from the mic at the quietest part of the song, and then everyone wasn't hushing as fast <laughs> as you yeah. wanted, and you turned around and went, shh! <laughs> <laughs> I have no memory of that. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, I re I remember it so vividly because I I was so entertained by it. Oh, that's funny. I, I this meant a lot to me. I'm gonna read you some lyrics. I might never catch a mouse and present it in my mouth to make you feel you're with someone who deserves to be with you, but there's one thing we've got going. And it's the only thing worth only thing worth knowing. It's got lots to do with magnets and the pole of the moon. Why won't our love keel over as it chokes on the bone and we can mourn its passing and bury it in snow? Later he says, you should look through some old photos. I adored you in every one of those, but if someone took a picture of us now, they need to be told that we had ever clung and tied a navy knot with arms at night. I'd say she was his sister, but she doesn't have his nose. And now we're unrelated and rid of all the shit we hated, but I hate when I feel like this and I never hated you. And mm. ah, it's just such a gorgeous... It is. This is the most poetic, I think, on this yeah, album for, for sure. sure. Um, usually, his lyrics are much are like lyrical, but like pretty straightforward in storytelling about like mm. concrete concepts and ideas. And this is one where he's just yeah, he's just using a lot more poetry, even though it's not. It's still like not super inaccessible or anything. Like you can still get what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, so so Scott struggled with 
depression his whole life and, and, and mental health issues and suicidal ideations. And uh, he actually wrote a song that we're going to talk about here in a little bit that specifically talks about considering suicide and then not committing suicide. Uh, in 2018, he gave an interview where he said, the, the interviewer asked him, how are you doing now? And he said, pretty fine, middling. On a day-to-day basis, I'm a solid six out of 10. I don't know how often I can hope for much more than that. I'm drawn to negatives in life and I dwell on them. They consume me. I don't think I'm unique in that sense. I'm all right with a six. If I get a couple of days at a seven, fuck, it's great. On May 8th of 2018, he wrote on Twitter, be so good to everyone you love. It's not a given. I'm so annoyed that it's not. I didn't live by that standard and it kills me. Please hug your loved ones. And then he wrote, I'm away now. Thanks. On May 9th, he was reported missing. I remember reading somewhere that somebody found his wallet and keys at a pub on May 9th. Grant, his brother, posted on Twitter asking anybody with information to call the authorities. And then on May 10th, they found his body washed up at Port Edgar in South Queens Ferry on the southern shore of the Firth, uh, an estuary of the River Forth. So Scott died in 2018. And he wrote this song called Floating in the Forth that ends the Midnight Organ Fight, where he, he says, so you just stepped out of the front of my house and I'll never see you again. I closed my eyes for a second, and when they opened, you weren't there. And the door shut shut. I was vacuum packed, shrink racked out of air, and the spine collapsed, and the eyes rolled back to stare at my starving brain. And then he imagines what it would be like to drown in the fourth. He says, I'm fully clothed. I float away down the fourth into the sea. And then he says, I'll think I'll, I'll, I think I'll save suicide for another day. And later he says, I think I'll save suicide for another year. And so he's He's so depressed, he's considering suicide, but there's just enough to keep going. And that song used to feel so beautiful to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, as I was kind of going through my own depression and my own kind of suicidal thoughts and things like that, um, that song meant so much. And and when he committed suicide, that song has become impossible to listen to now. <laughs> like I can't I know. There's no it's... joy in it at all, of course. It's just deeply, deeply sad. Which is really sad because you're right, like upon first listening when it's sh- even just shifting from for another day to another year mm. and then it has this like angelic like chorus that goes on behind that at the end of this song that just makes it feel so hopeful and so it's just so so sad that it has this like real life overtone now mm. yeah uh, you just can't read a lyric like, am I ready to leap? Is there peace beneath the roar of the fourth road bridge mm. and not be devastated? Yeah. I remember feeling something really singular and unique when when they announced that he had died, which was I mourned it like I would mourn a friend. Like it mm. that had never happened to me before. I, I generally don't have big reactions to celebrities dying, even even artists or celebrities who I really love and have moved me. I just don't feel that same sense of loss uh, because I didn't know them. Their their art, their music meant so much to me, but the music still lives on. And and so I I don't always react that way. But with Scott, I found myself in like a, a like kind of a take time off of work depression. And I think it's wow. just because his music had meant so much to me for so long that I was feeling deep grief um, that it was over and that I was never going to be at his show again and never going to sing with him again and never going. And yeah. some of those, those memories are, are some of the best memories of my life. Those Fright and Rabbit shows are my favorite concerts. And that was true before he, he no longer was able to, to perform. So he just meant so much. There was this Facebook group that formed, I don't know if it formed in the wake of this or if it had already formed and it took a new life afterwards, but there was this Facebook group that I found where people came together to create a real place of belonging, to care for each other in the wake of Scott passing. And I think if somebody said that that existed for another band, I'd be like, that's really over the top. Like that's really dramatic. But being a part of this group felt like really life giving. They were, there were people who were just saying, Hey, I'm struggling with depression or I'm struggling with this mental health issue. And all of us would just come around them in these Facebook comments and people would like call each other and like offer to call each other. At one point there was Mm. this postcard exchange. Uh, You signed up on a spreadsheet. And I received postcards from all over the world from people just saying, Hey, I miss Scott too. And, and I hope you're having a great day. And I sent oh some, God, that's know, myself, amazing. the sticker campaign and, and it continues on. I mean, he, that happened in 2018. And so five years later, that group is still supporting wow. people. A member actually committed suicide recently and the whole group is experiencing that death in, in a really meaningful way. And her father posted on 
the board and said, this group has meant so much to my daughter and, and what you, yeah, your, your care for her while she was alive meant so much to me. And wow. it's just an incredible tribute to, to what Scott meant to all of us. And, and, um, you know, the band members have started to do their own things now. Uh, Grant is touring with the Twilight Sad. They open for the Cure all summer, and Andy Monaghan has a band now. And and there's they're starting to do their own things. And I guess there's a, a somewhere out there is several demos that Scott recorded for another album. And the band has promised to do something with those at some point to to come back and record and try to turn them into a proper album. And mm-hmm. listening to that Beatles track <laughs> last week, I was gonna say using AI, of course. Yeah, you could maybe use AI to isolate and, and you know improve Scott's voice a little bit, make it sit on the rest of the music in a way that might feel really profound. There were, of course, big benefit concerts that came out of his passing and tribute albums, and 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 every now and then somebody will, will cover one of his songs, and they're all just so wonderful and. I miss I miss this this experience of of being a frightened rabbit fan and getting to see their concerts, but it's so lovely the way it's continued on. Well, and you didn't give even more context, which is that you and I and another friend of ours went to a tenth anniversary of the release mm. of Midnight Organ Fight yeah. concert that year where they played just this album front to back. Yeah. Like yeah. we had just seen them. And so I remember like we even just within our friend group, like us all being like, oh, my God, like this is just being devastated. It was it's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot still. It's hard to talk about still. It is. So let's just finish this up. I'm so like in the wrong place right now. But I was like, where do you go from there? (laughs) There's no like there's no natural. There's an artist named Frank Turner who uh, was a, a good friend of Scott's. And he had a lucid dream about Scott, a kind of a waking daydream. And he said it felt real. And he wrote a song about it. And he asked his brother, asked Grant's permission to to release it. And it is a really amazing song. It came out just this year, I believe. Oh, some sorry, just came out last year. It's called The Wave Across the Bay. And it says, I spoke with Scott last night. I was tired, but I wasn't sleeping. Despite what you think, I wasn't drinking. I was just finally ready to listen. And he was there all right. And I thought he'd probably just kill me for saying this, given how both of us are atheists, but there it is. There must have been a moment just before you hit the water when you were filled with a sense of peace and understanding with the wind in your hair and the light in your eyes as you realized you were finally escaping. But somehow in that moment, you miraculously miss it like a wave across a bay never breaking. And that's how I like to think of you ever falling, never landing, rolling slowly out to sea and always smiling. You're always smiling. And it goes on from there. And I think when I first heard this, I felt like, I don't know, I don't know where to put this song because it it almost glorifies suicide, which I don't love. Right. Um, it, it it takes this really tragic thing, turns it, and it almost says that it wasn't tragic, that it was good. Um, and but I I know from from reading more about Frank that that isn't how he feels. Um, this is just the lucid dream that he had, and he wanted to write it. And I found some some like closure is the wrong word, but that song has sat in a nice place for me. So if you are uh, somebody who loved Frightened Rabbit, I'd I'd recommend listening to that song. Um, It feels powerful to imagine Scott just being okay, being at peace now. He he so publicly struggled with mental health for so long that it's, it was heartbreaking listening to it. And Mm. he made incredible music out of that, that darkness. And and I'm grateful for it. I'm glad that he did that. I wish he could have gotten help that would have, even if it meant fewer, fewer songs that I loved, I wish he would have gotten the help that that could have changed something for him. But uh, that song was was powerful. As we know that some of the people have struggled the most with mental health issues are some of the people who've made the, best art best music the best those exploring those darker places around our psyche is it creates some really really beautiful relatable things yeah absolutely well i think we have how do you recover from this yeah. for birthday episode where do you <laughs> i want to know where you, what's the segue here what's the natural well, i think segue? i think you put on some more music you know we talk about honorable mentions and we talk about ken and um, we remember the the good parts of this thing. So for me, this not only sits in my canon, but is my other than Kid A, my favorite record ever. And in my personal hall of fame, a whole wing of it gets to be just about Scott and Frightened Rabbit and yeah. a Binet Organ Fight and Pedestrian Verse and some of the others. Yeah. It's so, yeah, be absolutely in my canon too. I don't rank things like you do. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Typically. You're a better man for it. But if I was, it would be in top five at least. 
Yeah. It's up there. Yeah. Do you listen to it much anymore? I, I found for, for a while it was very hard to listen to the music. And I, I finally, in the last couple of years, I've, I found myself able to listen to all of it again and, and enjoy it. But it took a long time. Yeah, I had a really hard time listening to it after Scott's death, for sure. Not just because of floating in the fourth, but just at all. Yeah. The like, self-deprecation and tragedy and mental struggle yeah. of this album made it really hard to listen to. But I've definitely found my way back in. Maybe not quite at the frequency. Sure. I'm just, but I think that's more like I'm just out of the habit and there's like yeah. so much other music to listen to. Yeah. When I think about the best, the best like scenarios to listen to this album, there isn't a bad one, but certainly this song sounds real good with the windows down on the road. It sounds real good in the backyard yeah. with some friends. It sounds real good. You know, uh, there's so many scenarios, so yeah. many great road trip album, great backyard barbecue album, maybe without keep yourself warm. <laughs> if kids <laughs> around, <laughs> But it definitely like played this around the house. Like there's just, ugh, there's so much. I've, I've just sat and listened to it in my headphones because there's so much emotional atmosphere to explore there. So Certainly the best album for a breakup or in lieu of a breakup, best album for things feel bad <laughs> right now. And I want to yeah. want to feel bad with somebody, but also feel good I, about it. I think Get it's fair to say place. it's the only breakup album in my like kind of top 10 for sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I Is that true for me? I think so. It's interesting. Yeah, we talked about it with the Swifty episode that like I'm not really drawn to a lot of a relationship drama kind of narratives in the music <laughs> that I love. But yeah, Scott just makes it so relatable that you just can't not can't not yep. engage with it. Absolutely. Honorable mentions. I'm just going to list. I'm just going to say the pedestrian are, verse is so good. I mean, is this honorable mentions for Frightened Rabbit albums? Is that I think it's so. not honorable yeah. mentions for our birthday? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could talk about both of those things, but for me, I'm going to talk first about Frightened Rabbit. I'm going to say Pedestrian Verse and Winter Mixed Drinks are the next two albums to listen to after this one. And then there's this little EP they made called the Frightened Rabbit EP that has this song on it called Scottish Wind that is so wonderful and lovely and for some reason isn't on Spotify or iTunes, but you must seek it out because Scottish Wind is just a perfect little Frightened Rabbit nice. song. Yeah. Yeah, pedestrian verse definitely for me, and then whenever whenever mixed drinks might have besides for midnight organ fight the m- most songs that I go back to because you're right, loneliness and the scream. I also really like foot shooter. It's got this really cool rhythm to it. There's a lot of good songs on here, but pedestrian verse with acts of man. I mean, we could do a whole podcast just on that song. Yeah, there's a lot to holy and uh, oil slick yep. and. The Woodpile, oh, it's a great record. And even Painting of a Panic Attack has songs like I Wish I Was Sober. Like there's there's good stuff on it, even though I, I even on our there podcast, is. I kind of poop on it a lot because <laughs> I'm frustrated <laughs> uh, with the uh, the national of it all. But it's a really good record. The national of it all. I love that. <laughs> uh, real quick, what else would you call out as best albums for celebrating Kayla's birthday? Well, I mean, is it celebrating Caleb's birthday or is it celebrating Caleb and Dave's birthday? Oh, that's like, interesting. Because that would be a shared, because that's kind of our conceit. Like, Yeah, I think that's love. right. There's probably, there's not that many albums where we overlap as these are our all-time favorites. Yeah, because uh, if you're we'll talking about shared love, we're definitely going back to Radiohead. We're going back yep. to Kendrick. Yep. Those are probably, that's probably some good area to explore. Feel free to play us a Deftones album or two. Oh, God, yeah, Deftones. <laughs> it's funny because I those are... Frightened Rabbit, Radiohead, Deftones, and Kendrick. Very different artists. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> All very different artists, very different <laughs> genres. So that's fascinating. Yeah. Probably uh, probably a little melancholy, Smashing Pumpkins throw in there as well. I have yeah. a I have a, uh, a memory of you rented a car or something. You had a car for like one night and we like joyrided to a Sonic <laughs> <laughs> like in some oh, suburb of Chicago. This. Yeah. And yeah. I remember we were listening to like Q101 and Smashing Pumpkins came on and we all just like stopped and sang the lyrics really loud. Yeah. I don't even remember what song it was. It's probably 1979, but I'm not, I'm not actually sure. I have a yeah. really fond memory of doing that with you. <laughs> I think I was reviewing a car. It was like they'd given me a car to try out for various What, what was your circumstance where you were reviewing a car? How did that I'm an influencer, Dave. I don't know if you know this about me. <laughs> Sometimes I'm, I'm given products to review. That's legitimately what happened, but that's very that rarely happened? has happened. No, no, not at all. I think that's happened maybe twice my entire life. That's so funny. I Were know. they hoping you would like tweet about it from Obama's account? This is this is how long ago it was. They were hoping I would blog about it. Uh, 
Yeah. Wait, was this before or after you were Obama's? Caleb, before. for those of you who don't know, was the voice of Barack Obama on Twitter for years. Before. Yeah. Oh, okay. Look at you. Yeah. Okay. There's Why do you think Obama there. hired me, Dave? Because you were so good at reviewing he saw, cars. He actually obviously. saw that review and he was like, this guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Malia, oh, get me, get me, Caleb. This this has gone so Why would long. he ask his daughter? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, is there one album you want to throw out as uh, what you're listening to this week? Oh, one album. I'm listening to the new car- album by Hotline TNT Cartwheel, which I'm enjoying. Oh, is that good? I It got really good reviews, but I don't know that I like it as much as other people have. Okay. I'm trying to, because so many other people have said they love it so much, I'm trying to see, like, is there something here to explore that I'm not seeing? Hmm. But I've enjoyed it, but definitely not like it at the level that it's getting good reviews on i am really enjoying as i expected to to do the new album by spiritual cramp self-titled album which is just a super fun punk album it's like i would describe it as if the it i would describe it as if the killers were a lot more punk that's the sound okay but it's fun it's got a great song called talking on the internet that i will play ironically for my 14 year old son sometimes (laughs) all right i'll check that out Uh, I'm listening to this jazz album uh, that came out of this year by a woman named Jamie Branch, uh, Jamie, who also passed away last year. Um, but this album's called Fly or Die, Fly or Die, Fly or Die, World War. Uh, she's released Great several albums, title. and most of them have been called Fly or Die 1 or Fly or Die 2. And so this is the third Fly or Die album, and in the parentheses, World War. It was finished posthumously by some of her bandmates. Just an incredible collection of music. It is It is all over the place with the types of genres she's dipping into different nice music from all over the world and just a she's just a force to be reckoned with her her both as a trumpet player as a vocalist as a, as a songwriter i found myself having no choice but to dance around while listening to this record and i have been going after it really hard this week with this one i've been i've had it on repeat awesome. all week so check out jamie branch uh, even if you're not into jazz check out jamie branch because it's it's real good Nice. Love it. All right. Well, one more trip around the sun is done. And Check. we will uh, be back next week with regularly scheduled content, although we are getting real close to Christmas content. And it's real hard not to just do four straight Christmas episodes. <laughs> Don't say that to me, Dave. Don't say oh, it's happening. Me. The neighborhood it's happening, that I'm Caleb. in, they already put up the Christmas tree and I was offended. I was like, what are mm. you doing? We weren't even in the double digits of November and you're putting up a Christmas tree. Give me a break. To be fair, when this comes out, it will be like the 20th of November. So it'll be more appropriate. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. Then the day we're recording this, get out of here with Christmas. But is there there enough Christmas music for us to do a month's worth of content? Well, there is enough Christmas music. Is there enough Christmas music that we would actually want to talk about? So here's, uh, let me just, let me just game plan this out with you a little bit and maybe I'll cut this and maybe I'll leave it in. I was like Uh, game planning it out live on the podcast. I love it. So we're definitely going to do a best album for Christmas time. We have to. Yeah. And then I think we should do one of our first, we want to do this thing called let's make a mixtape. We got to see if our friend uh, is available to do this with us, but I want to make a mixtape with you of the best individual Christmas songs. Cause I like that, you know, there, there's just a need. And then we're going to be already into kind of end of the year top <laughs> albums. <a> need. <laughs> we're going to be into like best of by, by the time that's through. Yeah, so I thought for our Christmas episode, we could do a little gift exchange. I thought I could give you an album that I want you to spend a little time with. And you can give me an album I want that you want me to spend a little time with. But not necessarily Christmas related. No, no, no. Okay. Just a gift exchange to each other. So Got I'm going to have you spend a lot of time with Good Kid Mad City. So we can talk about that deep. Oh, that is not a hardship for me. And then you just need to give me a Christmas gift of an album that you want me to listen to a lot so we can talk about it during that episode too. All right. right. Does that sound like a good episode? I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. So you all out there can also gift each other or gift me with albums you want me to listen to. I would love to hear them. Thanks, of course, for listening. And we will see you next week. Fun. Fun.